Hi, my name is Mina. Welcome to Kids Talk Church History, a one-of-a-kind podcast where kids investigate the history of the church. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Has he kept his promise? How has Jesus built and preserved his church against all odds? Come with us on a trip through history to find the answer here on Kids Talk Church History. Some time ago, we did a mini poll to find out what kids knew about Martin Luther. We tried to do that another time about the Puritans, but we didn't get as many responses. It seems that most kids have just a general idea about them. We talked about the Puritans in another episode, but today we'll be talking about one in particular, Thomas Goodwin, and some of his questions that were actually common at that time. Hello, my name is Trinity. I'm 16. I live in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm Christian. I am 14, and I live in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm Emma. I'm 16, and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm actually just learning about the Puritans, too. Like most of the kids in our poll, I also have only some general ideas. I actually don't know a lot about the Puritans, except for the real famous names. Yeah. Um, a 12-year-old in our poll said that first came the Reformation, and then came the Puritans. And that's pretty much what people know about the Puritans. I don't know a whole lot either, but I do know that some of them separated from the church in England. They didn't really agree with the way of worship and the doctrine. And I'm just learning about some of them. I know about Anne Bradstreet, Oliver Cromwell, and William Bradford. Oh, goodness. I love Anne Bradstreet. She's just my favorite poet in the whole wide world. Um, I know a bit about the Puritans from studying early American history and British history. Um, and every year around Thanksgiving, my mom does a Puritan unit study of sorts. Yeah, and I know a little bit about John Bunyan. Okay, I didn't realize that he counted as a Puritan, but I know about him too. Yeah, and one kid in our poll knew about John Owen, which is actually really impressive. And then we will have another episode about Owen later. And a 16-year-old said that she remembered unused names like Cotton Mather, Increase Mather, and Praise God Bear One. She also knew about Oliver Cromwell from her history books. That list tells you how different Puritans were from one another. We've already learned that we can't put them all in the same box. Exactly. And today we'll be talking about something many Puritans seem to have had in common in their experience. Even as children, they had tender consciences and felt terribly sorry for their sins. And some of them didn't really understand the gospel until later in their life. So that made their experiences more painful. We'll take one of them, Thomas Goodwin, as an example. Have you ever heard of Thomas Goodwin? It sounds super familiar. Yeah, he was an important Puritan born on October 5th in 1600 in a small English village. As a child, he really wanted to be a good Christian and cried hard whenever he sinned. His goal in life was to become a preacher. When he was 14, he looked forward to an Easter when he thought he was going to be able to take the Lord's Supper for the first time. He thought, I should be so confirmed that I should never fall away. But when the day came, his tutor told him that he was still too young to partake in the Lord's Supper. And it was a huge disappointment to Thomas. Yeah, I know some kids take it when they are even younger. My brother himself took it when he was nine. I can relate to Goodwin's frustration because when I I just started taking the Lord's Supper uh, last Easter, actually, just a few months ago. So I just felt like everyone around me, even the people who were younger than me, were taking it before I was. But thankfully, I have a family who supported me and talked me through the importance of sometimes waiting to take the Lord's Supper and understanding what I actually believed about it. Yeah, I really appreciate my own parents have been very good at emphasizing that it's not just a thing that we do, but it matters. And waiting until you understand why it matters is a good thing. Yeah, Goodwin felt especially rejected. He even stopped praying and reading the scriptures. He still studied to be a preacher, but only because he wanted to be a celebrity preacher, dazzling his listeners with fancy words. I guess because we're having a podcast on him, that means it must have changed, correct? (laughs) Correct. One day while he was going out with friends to have some fun, he heard a bell ring for a funeral. And one of his friends convinced some of the others to go and hear the sermon that would take place during the funeral. That's really odd. (laughs) I know, especially since... Nowadays, funerals, you you don't really get invited to them. I wonder if sermons were considered entertainment because they were not, there's not much going on. We can ask our expert about this later. Anyhow, Goodwin went along and the sermon was on repentance and Goodwin felt like he was speaking to him. 
He repented and decided to go back to his previous pastor who told him, young man, if you ever would do good, you must preach the gospel and the free grace of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what he did. There's a lot more to his life, but our time is really short, especially since we really want to hear about what our expert has to say, who has kindly accepted our invitation in spite of his busy schedule. We have here Dr. Michael Horton, who is the J. Gresham Machen Doctor or Professor of Systematic Theology and Apologetics at Westminster Seminary, California, and who has written his thesis on Thomas Goodwin. Dr. Horton, thank you so much for joining our podcast. We really appreciate it. I am so honored to be a part of this, I, and I'm so impressed with the uh, with your the knowledge that you all have. It's and the interest, that's even more important. Yes. So as you know, we you've heard a little bit about our brief introduction about Goodwin. Did we miss anything about his early life or would you have anything to add that might be important? Yeah, no, that's that's uh, I think you did a great job of its background and hitting hitting the highlights. And it just, you know, I'm sure that that uh, you can understand how how even though he was kept back from communion because uh, he was considered too young, that how how that's done is so important. It 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 can really throw a, a young person off when they're so excited. They're they're you know he went through the Heidelberg Catechism. That's that's what they they used, and uh, it just crushed him and led him into a life of just you know. Uh, like uh, all of his other schoolmates, just hanging out, doing, going to parties, uh, and and kind of just walking away until that moment when uh, his pastor really um, encouraged him to. Pre- Don't you love that? To pre- if you would do good in the world, preach the free grace of God, and that's what he did. Yeah, and speak about that moment when he realized that what. Did he hear in that funeral service that he had not understand understood before? What made him change his mind? Um, the, you know, the the fact of death has a way of triggering <laughs> some thoughts about what happens after this life. Um, you know, we never know when the Lord will take us, and that unsettled good one. It made him made him think more about uh, whether his faith was really grounded on Christ or whether it was a kind of fleeting thing. And as we mentioned before, it was kind of strange for his friend to to suggest going to a funeral while they were trying to have fun. Would you say that they were trying to put the fun in funeral? (laughs) Yeah, it is. It is odd, isn't it? And I, 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 you may be right that it was, because it was the only entertainment in town, sad to say. Uh, but I think also uh, from the fr- from the description of that event, it had something to do with uh, their their uh, kind of careless, joking manner. And so I I, I wonder if. They they went to the funeral as a kind of, you know, uh, cavalier in a kind of cavalier way as as part of their their boredom wandering around town, you know. Uh, but I I don't think that they I don't think that they they went there be out of a particularly religious uh, motive. So. We had to keep our introduction short, but Goodwin became a very influential pastor after his conversion, preaching the gospel without using fancy words. I know he had to flee to the Netherlands for a while while the English government cracked down on Puritans, and when he returned, he took part in the Westminster Assembly, where a group of pastors worked on the Westminster Catechism and Confessions that we still use today. What was his main contribution to the Assembly? As as the great disturber of the Assembly, as he was called, um, he was part of uh, the so-called dissenting brethren, meaning that he was de- dissenting from the official state church, which Parliament had uh, organized as Presbyterian. 
So we have to remember um, that there there were separatists, people who just left the Church of England, and many of them went to Holland. So, and some of them sailed on the Mayflower. Uh, but they these people we're talking about were not separatists. They they generally speaking, Puritan Puritan is a really as you said a broad category. It's not even a very good one. Um, the 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 great Elizabethan Puritan uh, uh, William Perkins, in fact, said uh, that's a terrible term of of attack that they call us Puritans. It's the last thing we want to be called. We're sinners saved by grace. And uh, their critics called them Puritans because they wanted to purify the church. They wanted to keep the Reformation going, as it were. Um, so they were all part of the state church. The state church went from being Episcopal, that is having bishops, to being Presbyterian, ruled by equal ministers and elders, to uh, independent under Cromwell. So Cromwell was a, a congregationalist, an independent, who believed that independent congregations are autonomous. And he took over the government and therefore the church. Even when the New England Puritans came over, they established a state church in Massachusetts. If you were a Baptist or, heaven forbid, a Quaker, uh, you you couldn't live in New England. You were exiled. Um, and so it was a, a very much a, a, a this view that the that the the public church is instituted by the government. So the Westminster Assembly was called by Parliament, and they allowed a few Episcopalians and a few Congregationalists to be a part of it as dissenters. Dissenters just meant you were not agreeing with the current form of the state church. So Goodwin really wanted churches to be independent. He didn't want there to be uh, any obligation of independent churches to other churches, and uh, he was convinced of that. But his his main interest, his main concern was uh, to promote the same gospel that the rest of the Westminster Assembly was uh, enshrining in the Westminster Standards. So your thesis is called Thomas Goodwin and the Puritan Doctrine of Assurance, Continuity and Discontinuity in the Reformed Tradition, 1600 to 1680. I assume you'll forgive us for not reading it since it's 465 pages long and we are still kids. I don't think I've read it. (laughs) We're curious about the title. How is Goodwin helping people to be certain of God's saving love for them? Yeah. Um, Well, first of all, let me just say on a personal note, um, I, I, it's wonderful when you can do a doctoral dissertation that makes you cry. Uh, he, 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 I mean, usually you cry over it just because it's too hard. But I, I, there were so many times reading good one where I just had to, had to stop. It was pure devotional, you know, uh, literature. Everything he wrote, even when he was writing about uh, complex theological matters, he was writing about it as a pastor. He he wrote about it directly to my heart as I'm reading it. And uh, the way he puts things is just amazing. Um, particularly his book, Christ Set Forth to Sinners on Earth. That's a little different from Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, Christ Set Forth... Christ, Christ set forth to sinners on, or or um, the heart of Christ in heaven toward sinners upon earth. You think, what a beautiful thing to meditate on. Uh, the uh, man's restoration by grace, uh, Christ our mediator, the object and acts of justifying faith. Good one, just could not stop writing about Christ and his his uh, gracious 
mediation. It was his whole focus. Yeah, and we mentioned before how Goodwin struggled with the assurance of his faith. And I know some kids have fears about not appeasing God. And I've even heard some kids around like second to fifth grade say that they're terrified of going to hell because of their sin that they're committing. And even if the parents point them to Christ, do you think that it has to do with like personality or is, or is it something different? That's a good point. Yeah, I think part of it does have to do with personalities. I think it also has to do uh, with different different times and places. You know, when um, people are down and out, and he had lots of those periods in his life, when people have really experienced the bottom, they have a greater appreciation for God's grace. And when people are in power and people are uh, sensing that that they can kind of determine the course of history and other people's lives, th there's a tendency to sometimes abuse that and to drive people further away from Christ. Goodwin was one of those people who really needed the gospel that he preached. He personally needed it. He didn't just think others needed it. Uh, he needed to set his, fix his, his eyes upon Christ as Savior all the time. I think that sometimes we can tend to focus on our faith rather than on Christ. You know, faith in faith almost. How much faith do I have? Uh, if If Roman Catholics say we're saved by works, uh, we say we're saved by faith, but we're not actually saved by faith. We're saved by Christ. Uh, faith looks to Christ for justification, and that's an emphasis throughout good one's works, especially the object and acts of justifying faith. Faith looks to Christ. Faith doesn't look at itself. Faith looks outward to Christ. So if I'm really struggling, and I, I'm I have a lot of doubts. The last thing I should do is focus on how much faith I have uh, and focus on Christ. Hear more about Christ. Faith comes through preaching and preaching through the Word of Christ. So the more we hear of Christ, the more that flame begins to 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 spark it you know Jesus said that uh a bruised reed he will never break in a in a flickering candle he won't snuff out and good one really believed that yeah i know it can be hard to you know quote unquote feel saved when you continue to wrestle with sin particularly with rebellion cuz it's you know this ultimate i don't want to do what god says just cuz i don't want to um how would Goodwin respond to that, especially with his experience of going through a period of rebellion and still, you know, being saved and loving God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think by having having a, a robust concept of of sin, that sin is a matter of the heart, and an, uh, if our hearts are set upon things that cannot satisfy, things that rob us of our happiness and our joy, but we think for the moment they're satisfying. If our hearts are set on anything lower than God in Christ, then we make them idols, but they can't really, they can't really satisfy. As Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. You made us for our, for, for yourself. And so the, I think Goodwin says over and over again that we 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 only we, we it's not just about correct doctrine, correct beliefs. It's setting our affections on Christ, our heart and His heart. Uh, he talks a lot about the heart, God's heart toward us, our heart towards Him. Uh, it, and again, that comes by by hearing the story over and over again by hearing Christ from Genesis to Revelation 
preached and taught and sung and prayed, participating in the, uh, the assembly of saints on earth that is joined with the assembly in heaven. And that really changes our affections. It changes our heart. It changes our desires. Uh, why should we set our affections on him and not on anything lower? Um, why should we why, why should we be satisfied in in God alone? Because he has given us not only life but everlasting peace through Jesus Christ. So to hear about that more and more the, we, we not only come to know it, but we come to love it and to love him. It does remind me of that verse. I think Paul says that, you know, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I do do, I don't want to do. Um, and that kind of, it really is the Holy Spirit and not us or what we feel like or even what we do, but it's Christ and oh, the yeah. work of the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Emma. And you, you mentioned that Romans 7, you notice he's, he, he, goes on to say, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Oh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Once he takes his eyes off of his miserable self and his, his fluctuating back and forth, obedience, disobedience, once he takes, him, takes his eyes off of himself, he fixes his gaze on Christ, he says, oh, that's my deliverer. That is my salvation. That is my hope. Not in here, but there at the right hand of God. Yeah, I remember my previous pastor, you know him, Pastor Brown, used to quote Luther, who said some Christians like to stare at their belly buttons, meaning they like to look inside their hearts instead of looking up to Christ. And I think that's mm -hmm. what uh, you kind of said. I think that this is also somewhat similar to what Goodwin was saying. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. No, that's exactly what he was saying. Okay. Do you have a favorite quote by Goodwin? Mm. Oh, goodness. Um, uh, based on a text in 1 John, he, he said, uh, God's heart towards you is greater than your heart towards him. That's um, a really good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, go, well, there are so many. That, yeah. It, it's just, it's hard to read a page of good one without pausing and, and reflecting on it. Not because it's hard to understand, but because it's so easy to understand and so rich. Mm. Yeah. Are, so are there any books by Goodwin or other Puritans, except for John Munyon, easy enough for kids to write, to read or that you would recommend um, reading at some point? Sure. For Goodwin, I would recommend it. There's in, in the Puritan paperbacks series uh, published by Banner of Truth. Um, there are some really good ones. Christ Set Forth is one. Um, and uh, the Heart of Christ in Heaven Towards Sinners on Earth. There's an updated English version that's independently published. You can find it on Amazon. And I'd recommend that be because sometimes his 17th century language can be hard to understand. And, and so this updated English version could be, uh, could, could be useful. Just you know, go to Amazon and, and type in the heart of Christ in heaven towards sinners on earth. And uh, then if you want to dig a little more deeply, the object and acts of justifying faith. But I would say probably Christ set forth. Uh, I go there first. And it's just a little Puritan paperback. Uh, and and it's, it, it's a rich introduction, I think, to his whole, his whole message. Yeah, so before you go, if you can meet one of the Puritans today, besides Goodwin, we would assume that he's your favorite. Who would you choose? <laughs> well, I, I, I think I, Owen, John Owen, um, and William Perkins. Let's see. Um, 
John Preston, who was Goodwin's predecessor uh, at Cambridge. Um, I think you have to be careful. I and I would I would sort of uh, uh, offer this cavil. Be careful in reading the Puritans. Again, be, this is such a blanket term, covers a lot of people with a lot of different emphases. There, there are some Puritans who do not have this emphasis that that the better Puritans, as I would call them, have. There are navel-gazing Puritans. There are, Pur let's just call them 17th century English writers, pastors, um, who focus people on their own hearts and their own lives and what they're doing mm -hmm. uh and not then turning them to Christ good one was reacting against that as john owen was reacting against that and others were so you you have within this so called puritan movement different tendencies different emphases so i would i i would say you know Many many of the most important Puritans are are invaluable reading, but stay away from you know some of the others who might be a little bit more um, might drive you a further away rather than draw you to uh, Jesus. And I I think that's uh, an important thing to add. Well, Doctor Horn, thank you so much for these insightful answers to the questions that we had and adding. Uh, to Thomas Goodwin's story. We are very thankful for that you decided to spend this time with us. And listeners, keep telling us what you think of these episodes and keep asking hard questions. We'll pass them on to our guest experts as soon as possible. We're planning a big giveaway for Christmas with a bunch of books by Simonetta Carr, courtesy of Reformation Heritage Books. So be sure to enter. In partnership with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, on behalf of my co-hosts Christian and Emma, I'm Trindy, and thank you for listening to Kids Talk Church History. Mm -hmm.